Welcome to the Art and Research Center's second public lecture as part of our Arts of Haiti seminar se series. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome you to a talk by Dr. Kayama Glover, who led three thought-provoking seminars this week on Haitian literature and what we could learn if we took Haiti as the center of the world. Professor Glover is not only an expert in her fields of research, but an incredible incredibly dynamic pedagogue that we were very lucky to have with us this week. Next week, we'll conclude our three-week series with a seminar and public lecture by historian and curator Dr. Anthony Boggs, so I hope you'll join us for that one as well. All three of our guests for this series are also featured in season four of the Art and Research Center podcast on the arts of Haiti, which um, will launch this fall. And I hope you'll listen to our other seasons as well, which are already um, on all streaming platforms. And our season three will launch um, very shortly in May. If you haven't already, please check them out. Um, and. As always, all of our Art and Research Center events, along with ICA's digital initiatives, are made possible by the support of the Knight Foundation. With that said, I'd love to introduce you to our incredible speaker tonight, Dr. Kayama Glover, who is Anne Whitney Olin Professor of French and Africana Studies and Faculty Director of the Barnard Digital Humanities Center. Having received a BA in French History and Literature and Afro-American Studies from Harvard University and a PhD in French and Romance Philology from Columbia University, Professor Glover joined the faculty in 2002. Her teaching and research interests include francophone literature, particular, particularly that of Haiti and the French Antilles, colonialism and post-colonialism, and sub-Saharan Francophone African cinema. She advises students in French, Africana studies, comparative literature, and human rights. She is the author of a number of books, A Regarded Self, Caribbean Womanhood, and the Ethics of Disorderly Being, published with Duke University Press in 2020, and Haiti Unbound, a Spiralist Challenge to the Postcolonial Canon, um, published with Liverpool in 2010. She has published articles in the French Review, Small Acts, Research in African Literatures, the Journal of Postcolonial Writings, and the Journal of Haitian Studies, among others. She has co-edited several works, including New Narratives of Haiti for Transition Magazine, Translating the Caribbean for Small Acts, Marie Vieux Chauvet, Paradoxes of the Postcolonial Feminine for Yale French Studies, The Haiti Exception, and The Haiti Reader. Professor Glover has translated several works of fiction and nonfiction from French to English, notably Franck Etienne's Ready to Burst, Marie Chauvet's Dance on the Volcano, René Depest's Hadriana and All My Dreams, and Françoise Vergès's The Wombs of Women, Capitalism, Racialization, and Feminism. She is an awardee of the Penn Heim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Mellon Foundation, and the New York Public Library Kalman Center. She is the founding co-editor of the Archipelagos, a journal of Caribbean digital practice, the founding co-organizer of the Caribbean Digital, and the founding co-director of the Digital Humanities Project in the same boats towards an Afro-Atlantic intellectual cartography. In 2018 to 2019, she was a resident fellow at the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination in Paris, France, where she began work on her new book project, For the Love of Revolution, René des Pestes and the Poetics of a Radical Life. And she is also currently working on a book, book of essays, Blacknesses in French. She's incredibly accomplished. Um, so uh, without further ado, let, let us welcome Dr. Kayama Glover. Um, we will follow the lecture with a Q&A, so please hold on to your questions until then. Thank you so much. All right, successfully made it onto the stage. Mission accomplished. Thank you so much, Donna. That was long um, and a little embarrassing, but I, I really appreciate the introduction. I appreciate the invitation from the ICA, from you in particular this week, to be in conversation with, honestly, an incredible group of interlocutors, students, artists, cultural producers, thinkers. I was enlightened, frankly, and, and really began thinking differently about the way I even do the work that I do. So thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this this week. I'm, I'm truly grateful. So um, I'll just launch right into what I'll talk about today, the title of which is Haiti and the Fictions of History. 
A little anecdote to start off. Last year, I got an email from a colleague named Hazel Carby, former professor at Yale, on behalf of the documentary filmmaker Raoul Peck, the scholar Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, and herself, inviting me to contribute to an anthology that they'd been contracted to put together for Pantheon Books. And they were trying to bring together a volume that would be, as they said, inspired by Peck's recent HBO four-part series of films, Exterminate All the, Br the Brutes. Has anyone seen that series? Just to know. OK, a couple of people. I, I recommend it. Um, it's one hour, four parts, that kind of does the history of the world, but from the perspective of sort of Haiti and the Caribbean being the center of that world. So they wanted to have me, as a scholar of Haiti, offer some reflections on how Haiti has been produced in the global cultural imagination. And this was an exciting prospect. I had watched Peck's documentary series. And while I can't say that I have enjoyed it exactly, it's, a, it's rough going, it did make me think. I had thoughts. And the thoughts that I had are what I want to share with you all tonight, kind of a prelude to what I'll be writing for this volume. And so these thoughts I have are in three parts about Haiti and the fictions of history. So part one, the New York Times, HBO, and capital H history. So as many of you are perhaps aware, Haiti recently got top billing in a special weekend edition of the New York Times. Several thousand words of copy spread over five articles, a timeline, and a bibliography greeted the paper's nearly 10 million subscribers on a May weekend in 2022. So out of curiosity, who saw that series, The Ransom Project? All right, so again, a, a smattering of folks. Now, of course, this wasn't the first time that Haiti had been featured in The Times, by no means. Haiti had been front page news before, but, but this was something different. Whereas in the past, news about Haiti amounted to variations on the theme of political, economic, or environmental disaster, the headlines on that weekend in May were telling a different story. Rather than offering yet another tale of Haiti's misery fixed squarely in the present day and bracketed by some immediate crisis, this series of deeply researched and meticulously reported articles promised readers a history lesson, a counter-history lesson. The Times story, titled The Ransom, Haiti's Lost Billions, presented a thorough account of the country's past and present day struggles in a chronicle that deeply implicated the United States, France, and the wider Atlantic world. The idea was that Haitian history is global history and that Haiti's past is the bedrock of our collective present. In other words, Haiti is the center of the world. And this was a compelling present, right? One that, as the folks who are in the seminar know, I very heartily agree with. And like many of us who have long been studying and teaching and researching and writing about Haiti, I was honestly thrilled to see the nation's story come to light in this way. I was thrilled by the fact that a wider audience spreading well beyond the bounds of the academy would be reading many for the first time about Haiti's revolution, about the punitive indemnity and the usurious double debt imposed by the French, about the brutality of the US Marine occupation, and about the destabilizing intrusions of the American and French governments in Haitian politics, among else. This was a history lesson laid out in digestible form, bearing the journalistic authority of one of the world's most respected publications, and backed by some of the most prominent scholars of our time. So I wondered, was this what Haitian-American anthropologist and performer Gina Athena Ulysse called the new narrative of Haiti, something we'd all been looking for for some time? Was this the long-awaited unsilencing of Haiti's past? Well, the short answer is yes. Yes, it was. If representations of Haiti have historically been limited by stereotypes that simultaneously alienate and victimize the nation and its diasporic communities, then May 2022 was kind of a breaking open of that prison. In the face of the grand narrative of Western modernity, with its stories of enlightened universalism and scientific advancement in Europe, and of conquered savages and manifest destiny pretty much everywhere else, the Times' ransom project was meant to serve as an intervention an overdue corrective to the persistent story of righteous Western domination and a refusal of the always justified forward march of white history. The facts were not new, no, but them being admitted into evidence in that way, on that stage, that was unprecedented. Now, in producing this series, the four journalists who reported the story made certain to trumpet their research bona fides. Quote, 
The New York Times spent months sifting through thousands of pages of original government documents, some of them centuries old and rarely, if ever, reviewed by historians. We scoured libraries and archives in Haiti, France, and the United States to study the double debt and its effect on Haiti, financially and politically. And so the journalists cited their many sources, human sources, textual sources, in a 5,000-word bibliography of the primary materials, secondary sources, historians, econ economists, and other scholars that informed their findings. The Times also published and identified the source for every piece of data that it used to make the debt calculation, along with the assessments of the many economists and financial historians who reviewed the data, methodology, and conclusions. The goal was transparency and to give others the tools to continue looking into the issues addressed in the project. In other words, the goal was credibility. We have been to the archives and we have turned over every stone possible to deliver this counter history to you. You readers can believe these conclusions because they emerge from our encounters with materials coming directly and incontrovertibly from a complicated past. Materials that we at the Times have absorbed on your behalf and now present to you. Experts have weighed in, the ledgers have been balanced scrupulously, every I has been dotted, every T has been crossed. These are truths not previously known. This is capital H history, brought to you this Sunday by the New York Times. Now, similarly, and on a different platform, Raoul Peck's powerful documentary film series, Exterminate All the Brutes, was equally committed to making a historical intervention on a broad stage. Broadcasted on HBO over four nights in April of 2021, this series reached millions of viewers and issued a vehement correction to false narratives about colonialism and other violent emanations of Western civilization. And the word civilization is pretty much in quotes throughout the entire series. Haiti is, Peck announces early on, quote, a country forcefully overlooked in its role in changing Western world history, end quote. And in this counter-narrative that he provides in the film, Haitian modernity is the ur example of how non-white people throughout history and across the globe have been subjected to the degrading fantasies and insatiable veracity of racial capitalism. History is the fruit of power, Peck declares, and his goal in this film is to seize that power through provocative reinterpretations of the information that are provided or not provided in the archives. And so to do so, he really relies on three big books. Sven Lindquist's Exterminate All the Brutes, Michel Roff Trouillot's Silencing the Past, and Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Now, all three of these works are very clear about their intention, and that ent intention is extremely ambitious. These three historians mean to set the proverbial record straight, to contest, to undo, and to expose to the light the supremacist atrocities that both underpin Western civilization and produce the self-justifying tales that the West tells about itself. And like the Times series, the story that Peck tells evokes spectacular moments of great historical import, vast sums of money and mass casualties, heroic figures taking on egregious injustices, lives risked and lost in bloody conflicts, and in both series, the HBO series and in the Times, history, the capital H, big, sweeping, forward marching, is the matter. Now, all this is, of course, not entirely new. About a half a century ago, the Martinican intellectual Edouard Glissant, who some of you might be familiar with, wrote an essay collection titled Caribbean Discourse. And there he talked about the importance of attending to histories or stories in the face of the, Cap the, the Caribbean's exclusion from capital H history, as determined by the reluctantly former colonial powers of Europe. And so what Glissant does is he leans into this word or its semantic possibilities of the word histoire, which in French translates into English both as history and story. And so he leans into that double possibility and he tries to disentangle the two meanings. What he argues is that what we have long accepted as history, that is, capital H history, as the truth of our collective human global past, amounts, in fact, to a litany of self-interested stories told by, well, money-hungry genocidal xenophobes. That's his primary idea. And now, he wrote this back in the 1970s, and it was a bold assertion at the time. And though he wore a lot of different intellectual hats throughout his, his career, he was a poet, he was a novelist, he was a philosopher and a literary theorist, he wasn't trained as a historian. But he thought deeply and he wrote compellingly about the Afro-diasporic quarrel with the past. History, he always maintained, is only ever stories. 
And although black peoples have largely been relegated to the footnotes of Europe's chronicle of the human, they didn't have to accept banishment to the margins of that story. They didn't have to remain in the footnotes. And he argued that in the absence of robust historical narratives and faced only with archives that sustain the silences and the misrepresentations of empire, black people must produce their own stories. And so Glissant's crucial move, his stratagem, his naming of history as story, calls for an interpretive approach to what has only ever been a colonial narrative. And by a colonial narrative, I mean an archive constituted by colonists in the interests of colonizing. And this perspective is now well accepted in the academy. It's the bedrock on which alternative understandings of the past have very much been built and maintained over the last 30 or so years. And Glissant himself went on to weave an entire Antillean epic out of history's shadows. His series of novels, Le, La Lézarde, Le Quatrième Siècle, Malmort, La Case du Commandeur, Maragonie, Tout le Monde, and Sartorius, these seven novels offer Caribbean peoples what he calls, quote, a prophetic vision of the past. Right, so you can hear this sort of temporal undoing, a prophetic vision of the past. And what that means is, if this present that we currently inhabit is based on the history we think we know, i.e., those stories that have been given to us as truth, right? For example, in textbooks that have been scrubbed of the most uncomfortable elements of the past, as we see, for example, here in Florida, ongoing at the moment, if that's the case, then an alternative present can emerge, provided there are new stories to support it. And so Glissant proposes his prose fiction works as so many constitutive lowercase histories, multi-threaded refusals of the capital H history that undergirds the colonial order. And to effect this subversion, his works retrieve the ancestor who must have been, right? So this prophetic looking back into the past to retrieve someone who can help build the present and the future. And that ancestor for him is the Negre Marron, the original maroon. And that's uh, stylized, what you see there on the screen is a stylized rendering of a sculpture that sits in Port-au-Prince right now in Haiti, um, which is kind of the figure of this uh, runaway or formerly enslaved person with the conch shell as the sounding call to rally other enslaved to flee the plantation. So what Glissant does is he erects this figure as the missing hero of the Americas, the first escapee from Europe's history trap. He gives the figure a name and he invests him with a legacy. And it's that legacy that's traced from La Lézarde all the way through to Sarturius. It goes back and forth across the transatlantic, across the Middle Passage, across the transatlantic experience of capture, kidnapping, and enslaving to the present day and the descendants who live with that history. And so in many ways, the maroon was exactly what was needed, an originary incarnation of resistance and refusal. But I think that this figure also presented something of a new danger. I think Glissant's maroon ultimately left certain traps in place and even produced a differently troubling kind of lack. Because while the maroon filled an aching gap in the story of the black diasporic experience, he also cemented a certain continuity between colonial and what we might call decolonial historiography. And that continuity was patriarchy the reliance on grand narratives of great men and a relative inattention to the specificity of women's lives. Glissant's counter-historical, counter-narrative possibility thus contained its own aching gap. It created immense space for new stories, yes, but left a great deal of work to be done, women's work. And that's my part two, women's work. So in her much-referenced 2008 essay, Venus in Two Acts, which is a return to and an expansion on her breathtaking 1997 auto history, Lose Your Mother, Saidia Hartman rolls up her scholarly sleeves and gets to that women's work. Because indeed, if it's true that certain marginalized and neglected histories are being unsilenced with greater fervor on the whole, it is also the case that women's stories remain, as Hartman notes, quote, an asterisk in the grand narrative of history, end quote. And so in Venus in Two Acts, Hartman is determined to retrieve, to rescue two girls from a brutalizing archive of enslavement and to restore them to the world of the present. So what she does in this incredible, art, in this incredible uh, volume, Lose Your Mother, and then again in Venus in Two Acts, is she goes to the captain's log of a slave ship and finds this kind of minimal mention of these two girls who were beaten to death on the course of the Middle Passage, and she constructs a story of what their lives must have been, essentially. 
But the work that she is, the work that's required to effect this retrieval is painful and grueling and doomed from the start, and Hartman knows it. Her efforts approach their aim, but to her mind, they fall short. They could only ever fall short, because the archive itself falls short. She laments. Admittedly, my own writing is unable to exceed the limits of the sayable dictated by the archive. It depends upon the legal records, surgeons' journals, ledgers, ship manifests, and captain's logs, and in this regard falters before the archive's silence and reproduces its omissions. The, irrefer the irreparable violence of the Atlantic slave trade resides precisely in all the stories that we cannot know and that will never be recovered. This formidable obstacle or constitutive impossibility defines the parameters of my work. Now, faced with this archival silence, Hartman suffers the disciplinary limits of history. She has found these two women buried in the inhuman record books of the Middle Passage, and she is keen to give them both names and to invest them with a legacy, but she can't. The practice of writing history just doesn't allow this freedom. She writes, quote, narrative restraint, the refusal to fill in the gaps and provide closure is a requirement of my method. But this leaves her unsatisfied, heartbroken even. So the closest Hartman comes to exceeding the limits of the archive is through a practice of what she calls critical fabulation. And this was really, honestly, a gift that she gave to many of us in the, in the academy back in 2008, critical fabulation, right? So this idea that in the absence of information in the historical record, we are permitted to begin to imagine aloud those things that cannot be verified. Right, to just muse upon a past that might have been. And we talked about this quite a bit in the seminar over the last three days. Hartman gives herself a little bit of room to conjure the humanity of two girls whom the archive has memorialized only as commodities and victims of punishment. More precisely, she gives herself 63 words. 63 words for this imagining against the archival grain. Venus so she names one of the girls. Venus could have beheld her dying friend, whispered comfort in her ear, rocked her with promises, soothed her with soon, soon, and wished for her a good return. Picture them, the relics of two girls, one cradling the other, plundered innocence. A sailor caught sight of them and later said they were friends. Two worldless girls found a country in each other's arms. 63 words, and then, in her article, responsibly, as a historian, Hartman takes back what she has offered, accepting and explicitly staging the impossibility of telling a full, true story. And she leaves us, her readers, with the pain of knowing this can only ever be imagined and never recounted in any way that will satisfy our aching for stories. The fabulation she creates is not meant to endure only to disrupt, to disorder, to, quote, jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received or authorized account, and to throw into crisis a history that hurts too much. So Hartman bites at history's heels. She renders it unsteady on its feet. That's the best she can do within the confines of her discipline. But, and, despite its inevitable and self-declared inadequacies, by which I mean its disappointments, its frustrations and vexations, Hartman's work, like that of Glissant, cleared new space, cleared enough space for new histories to emerge. Her speculation into the archive has now subtended the work of an ever-widening circle of explicitly restorative historical practitioners. Black feminist scholars like Jennifer L. Morgan, Marisa Fuentes, and Jessica Marie Johnson have embraced the challenge of extracting women's lives, in particular, from the aching gap of history through practices of intellectual marronage that do not rely on Glissant's lost hero. The histories that they offer disclaim as they narrate. While they acknowledge that women may be present only scantily in the archive, they nonetheless identify discernible traces sufficient to ground their unsettlings of the history of the present. This is the point of departure for the ethical historiography that these scholars practice. 
Morgan, Fuentes, Johnson, and many others now foreground what cannot be known and make clear the parameters of their authority. Like the Times journalists, they have scoured thousands of documents and exhausted countless sources. They push steadily at the limits of capital H history. Part three, the fictions of history. In the end, though, the historian is stuck. She can come right up to the edge of that archival limit and she can peer over into the what clearly must have been, but she is bound, as Hartman writes, to quote, respect the limits of what cannot be known. But literary fiction, on the other hand, my wheelhouse, has no such obligation. It emerges precisely from the risky space of unknowability. Like history, literary fiction aims to make meaning through narrative. It is an epistemological formation. It is a way of knowing the world. Fiction calls, though, for a suspension of disbelief, such that the story might be invested with the authority of fact. Though it relies on historical data to provide what in grade school we're told is called setting, the novelist doesn't have to exercise Hartman's, quote, narrative restraint the restraint that keeps the historian in many ways tethered to an, indif an indifferent archive. So the writer of fiction knows history's limits, but she can choose to ignore them, to refuse them. She is unfettered, constrained only by her own means, that is, by her willingness and her ability to confront the experiences of imagined others, and then to bring to the fullness of the reader's experience those encounters that she has dared to imagine. And her aim is not at all to arrive at some digestible story, but rather to facilitate witness. The effectiveness of literary fiction, of literary fiction not effectiveness, let's say the affectiveness, right? The feelingness of literary fiction resides in the writers having risked the fraught adventure of crafting the painful worlds that she then invites us, the reader, to behold. And so it's with these thoughts in mind that I want to turn to finish up to three contemporary Haitian women writers of literary fiction whose work centers the peripheries of the hemispheric black American past. Evelyne Trouillot, Edwige Danticca, and Miriam Chancy. Their respective novels, which you see up here, attend to women's stories within the context of grand narrative events in history, respectively the Haitian War of Independence for Rosalie L'Infamme, the terroristic reign of François Papadoc Duvalier for Breath, Eyes, Memory, and the unnatural disaster of the 2010 earthquake in the Caribbean, What Storm, What Thunder, by Miriam Chancy. All of three of these works present historiographic interventions of a very particular order. They reveal big picture phenomena through small stories that place singular, self-telling beings at their center, right? So these are first-person narratives of the kind of folks that don't necessarily figure in the big stories that we see on television or that we read in the, in the New York Times. The stories they tell are grounded in testimony, and they do much of the work that history wishes it could. Trouillot's Rosalie l'Infamme, the, infam the infamous Rosalie, and Rosalie, um, it's kind of like a trick title because Rosalie does not refer to the name of the character, it's the name of the slave ship that brings over the ancestor of the central character of the book. The infamous Rosalie is set against the backdrop of the maroon leader François Macondal's 1758 poisoning campaign in Saint-Domingue. So careful, there are a few spoilers, but many of you who are in the seminar, um, we've already covered some of this ground, so not too bad. So historians describe this poisoning campaign really as the opening salvo of the Haitian Revolution, even though it predates it by almost 40 years. Trouillot's novel recounts the story of Lisette, a Saint-Domingue-born enslaved worker on the Fayot plantation and the daughter of one of three African-born women who survived the Atlantic crossing on the slave ship Rosalie. Through Lisette's first-person story, Evelyne Trouillot brings together a constellation of black women all of whom, though bound within the confines of enslavement, enact various forms of resistance and refusal. There is Gracieuse, sexual servant to both the plantation master and his wife, who finally dies following her seventh self-induced abortion, the last of her steadfast refusals to bear life into enslavement. There's Louise, who seeks with every child she conceives to produce a being too beautiful to be kept unfree. And there's Clarisse, who betrays her fellow enslaved in the hopes of keeping her, her child safe from harm. 
In these and in others of the lives that this novel imagines, black women deploy strategies of what we might call reproductive marronage in the face of slavery's most monstrous intimacies. Now, Rosalie emerged explicitly from Trouillot's encounter with an exceptionally disturbing instance of these kinds of gendered refusal, an incident, as she calls it, that she discovered in the colonial archive, recounted by the 18th century French physician, botanist, and historian of the revolution, Michel Etienne de Courtise. Now, in this document that Trouillot came across, de Courtise makes a really brief note of the trial of an African born midwife who turned herself in to the authorities in Saint Domingue and confessed to the crime of infanticide. The woman admitted to having killed more than 70 children at birth, black children. And she had kept a record of her deeds using a cord tied with a knot into it for each child whose life she had ended. And now from this incredible trace of this woman from court records and her own words of testimony during her trial that Trouillot found in the archive, this novelist goes on to create the character of Brigitte, our central character, Lisette's great aunt. Brigitte, a haunting presence in the novel who has died well before Lisette's story begins, is a catalyst for Trouillot's imagined histories of untraced and untraceable enslaved women in Saint-Domingue. Trouillot's rendering of color, emotion, and voice in scene after scene depicting the self-determined forms of intimacy and kinship that enabled African women and women of African descent to construct and enact freedom in the Atlantic world of enslavement. This process of recovery through fiction is its own kind of marronage, its own kind of escape. As Trouillot explains in her afterword to the novel, I forced myself as much as was necessary to respect the historical context. But the most essential thing for me, I'll admit, was to imagine and to create characters, men, women, and children, who experienced that infamy in all the complexity of their emotions and their passions. I must be forgiven then certain deviations and certain liberties taken. I make a claim only to the humanity of my characters. Crucial, too, to uh, Trouillot's storytelling project is the notion that no matter how thinly present in the archive, black women's trauma can be passed on. That past trauma can be constitutive of a transgenerational present. And so in this way, her novel is a prophetic vision of the past, but on a small and intimate scale. Trouillot's Lisette has inherited quite a lot from the great aunt she never knew. She has inherited the pain of her ancestor's story, the harrowing memory of the Middle Passage, and the knotted cord itself. The stories that the cord contains, as well as those her grandmother and her godmother tell her in the course of the novel, they become integral to her understanding of herself and to the legacy that she will offer to the baby girl she carries but does not yet know. So I encourage you all to read this book. Testimony, trauma, legacy, and the stakes of maternal inheritance are all concepts that matter in black Haitian women's lives, well beyond, of course, the tragedy of the Middle Passage and American slavery. The gendered violence that defined the colonial past also infuses histories that are nearer to us in time, but just as persistently silenced and obscured. Indeed, our world continues to bury uncomfortable stories and to undermine our capacity to address the traumas that they produce. Systemic anti-black, anti-woman horrors that have been at work throughout this hemisphere since well after abolition. And while they may bear the stink of old-time white supremacist racial capitalism, they are in fact phenomena of a different order, oftentimes. The murderous regime of François Papadoc Duvalier, Haiti's president from 1957 until his death in 1971, stands out as an especially devastating incidence or instance of what we can call intramural conflict, meaning essentially black on black crime. A black leader of a black nation, Duvalier committed crimes against black people that continue to be felt to this day. And in her 1994 novel, Breath, Eyes, Memory, Edwige Danzica evokes the well-known big history of Duvalier's obscene and merciless violence through the story of a survivor who must have been Danticat's protagonist and narrator, Sophie Kako, is a daughter of that survivor. Right? So this is not her story, but the story of her mother. She is the literal product of her, mo of her mother's violent rape by a tonton Makout, one of the legions of paramilitary security forces empowered by Duvalier to terrorize civil civilians. Sophie is the inheritor of her mother's trauma 
herself victimized by this woman who has been left too broken to care for her own child properly, too broken even to survive her own history. Both mother and daughter are left with stubbornly unhealed wounds. The story of Sophie and her mother resolutely refuses the presumption of endless resilience that often attaches to Haitians in general and to Haitian women in particular. For me, this notion of resilience is something of a double-edged sword. It's not the compliment that it often pretends to be. Resilience can also be the notion that certain beings are so accustomed to misery that their trauma somehow doesn't register, not for them, and certainly not for us, right? That somehow they experience pain and suffering at a level that matters less than it would if it were to happen to folks in the so-called first world. If disaster has been the conventional trope of Haitian history, resilience has long served as its complement. These twinned term concepts concretize perceptions of Haiti as at once imminently embattled and infinitely capable of withstanding catastrophe. That Sophie and her mother are generationally undone by the violence of Duvalier's regime shows clearly, however, that black women are in fact singularly vulnerable to annihilation by capital H history and the state. And so just as Toyo's Rosalie sidesteps the big historical event of the Haitian Revolution, Dantica situates her story in oblique relation to Duvalier's reign. Sophie and her mother are not in Haiti. They don't live uh, in Duvalier's Haiti. But rather, she situates her story in the aftershocks of Duvalierism, in exile, in Brooklyn, New York, where they've been forced from the insecurity of home into the insecurity of displacement. So in this way, not only does Danticat's narrative convey the so intimate toll of state-sanctioned gendered violence on an individual woman's life and legacy in Haiti, but it also provides a very singular face for the unnamed thousands forced out of Haiti into diaspora. Through her telling of Sophie's small story, Danticat pushes against the big narrative of so-called boat people that circulated so widely back in the 1970s, back again in the 1990s, and since, well into the present, a narrative that has so disparaged Haitians in the United States and elsewhere. In an afterword to the 20th anniversary edition of the novel, Danticat writes explicitly of what she sees as the survival stakes of storytelling. This is Dantica. I wanted to write a kind of fictional autobiography for Sophie, someone who has trouble remembering or who doesn't really want to remember certain parts of her life. I wanted the reader to feel as though Sophie is nearly out of breath as she's telling us all of this, as though the actual telling of the story is saving her life. So in the absence of capital H history, there is memory, Dantica suggests, in her title, of course, but also in a narrative that makes ample room for testimony. As Sophie's story unfolds, it becomes clear that the mere fact of telling, with the, possibly, the possibility or the hope of being heard, is an unsilencing as crucial as those that play out on more spectacular stages, like the New York Times or HBO. And I encourage you all to read this book. Now, this all being said, few people would argue that mere retrieval or uh, yes, retrieval, let's say, of un or underrepresented histories is sufficient to affect repair or even the novel gesture of giving voice, as we call it oftentimes in the present, to those who have been muted by history. This is a major factor. It's perhaps more profoundly a matter of history's inability to perceive its others, sensorially, that is, to see, to hear, or to feel the experiences of those deemed to be lacking the qualities of self which boil down to whiteness and its corollaries, masculinity, bodily ability, sexual normativity, and so forth. The question of whether or not the subaltern can speak is more accurately, or at least as legitimately, a question of whether or not she can be heard. In other words, if the subaltern speaks, does she make a sound? Or might she just as well be a palm tree falling on an uninhabited island, deserted in her unperceived existence? Countless trees fell on January 12th, 2010, in the very inhabited Haitian Republic. Churches and hospitals, hotels, and people's homes crumbled too. And while the deafening noise of the earthquake was most certainly heard across the world, it's not clear that the Haitian people became any more perceivable on the global stage than they had ever been. 
3 million affected by the quake, up to 250,000 dead. Nearly 300,000 stru structures collapsed or severely damaged. History keeps track of these sorts of statistics, but it scrubs them of any singularity. Our focus gets distorted by disasters of such magnitude. The faces of the victims become blurry, their voices muted by the sheer fact of their numbers, numbers of an order too immense to perceive. For this reason, mass suffering and death can be dull, as in not acute, lacking the sharpness of a blade of feeling in the heart or the gut. The indistinguishability of masses of miserable beings too easily transforms into the Agambanian indistinction of lives devoid of life, disembodied flesh, zombies. It can be challenging to see the humanity within undifferentiated hordes of sufferers, and harder still to love and by that I mean to see and respond to the lovability of any one of the many ones that make up the mass, that cacophony of misery and relentless need. Individual beings become hard to hear, what with all the noise. In her 2021 novel, What Storm, What Thunder, Miriam Chancy works to cut through the din so as to bring individual lives back into focus, or maybe rather to bring them into focus for the very first time. Her novel counts 11 chapters, most of them narrated in the first person, and each chapter relates the story of a single individual, their experience during the earthquake, but also the lives they lived before the event and in its immediate wake. Each character's story is punctually interwoven with that of one or more of the others via the threads of intimate, familial, and other social relations. An elderly market woman, her granddaughter, and the son, father, who abandoned them both. The mother of three, then of two, then of one, then of none. Her husband, and then their dying, and then dead son. The sex worker, her brother, struggling in US diaspora, and their sister, violated brutally in the camps. The jaded young hustler, humbled and then reborn. Chancy's characters are the kind of people who would be considered disposable or invisible to the unseeing eyes of much of the world. But in her rendering, they are singular and they're complex. They are able to perceive themselves. They're philosophical about their own circumstances and they're capable of comprehending circumstances well beyond the scope of their present condition. As her character Didier attests, their part in the human whole is a matter of literal perception. He says, we all look away unless it's us or someone we love going up in flames. You don't know what collective you belong to until your own house is on fire. Chancy's novel moves to create some clarity around collectivity. Having spent months and then years immersed in both academic and ac activist work on behalf of survivors of the 2010 earthquake, Chancy found herself bearing a surfeit of stories, too many stories. Unburdening herself of this charge by writing a novel was a self-conscious act of resistance to the constraints of capital H history. It was an effort to preserve the individual testimonies that otherwise would end up as no more than lifeless data in an archive of disaster. Chancy makes her intentions very clear. This is from her afterward. This work remains entirely one of fiction. Readers will have to forgive any departures from fact, historical timelines or geography taken within its pages as a consequence of artistic license, that is, for the sake of the story. I hope that I have captured what was at once a national tragedy and one with individual dimensions. In the end, what I wanted to capture was the way in which lives were disrupted, what those lives may have been like before, what might have remained after. Chancy's capturing of stories of before and after the historical event of the earthquake amounts to a textual instance of purposeful gathering, a rassemblage, defined by Gina Ulysse as, quote, a Haitian Creole term which can be translated as an assembly, compila compilation, enlisting and regrouping of ideas, things, people, and spirits. Rassemblage demands the creation of space for mutual recognition, pathways for self and other to move closer toward a notion of self and self. Chancy's narrative manages to convey such connection, such relation. She gives us a flow of networked humanness that pierces through the blanket tragedy of the earthquake to reveal the worlds beneath the rubble. The result is less a giving of voice than it is a fervent listening. And you guessed it, I highly recommend that you, that you read this book. 
So faced with history's willful blindness and persistent silencing, Trouillot, Dantica, Chancy, and other fiction writers of the Haitian past propose a relationship to capital H history that is visceral and sensorial, undaunted by archival indis indifference. And in probing the intimacy of individual lives, all of their works, which I encourage you all to read, all of their works aim to undermine the kind of disregard that makes Haiti and countries like it unrecognizable as sites of the human. Their stories provide material for imagining beyond the stereotypes that circumscribe certain kinds of lives. They give us names for those who we've never known, but who we mustn't forget. These writers are unsparing in their telling of ruinous histories, including those nearest to our present day. And yes, they assume the real risk of inadvertently performing or replicating the violence that they can never fully know. But again, literature only ever exists in that space of risky unknowing, of daring to imagine and presume. The agonizing counter-narratives we encounter through these writers' imaginations refuse the notion that there are elements of our past too horrendous for representation. Their works make clear that there is no such thing as the unthinkable or the unspeakable. Such terms are metaphors, metaphors that their writings force us to abandon. Sometimes the unpalatable stuff must be swallowed, so much food for historical thought. And these works of fiction are crucial nourishment, accountable only and ultimately to our hunger for stories. And as readers, we know well when we have truly been sated. Thank you so much for listening. Hello. Um, hey, so, I, uh, hi. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I heard you wrong, uh, but at the end there you described a, a cultural or historical assemblage. Rassemblage. Rassemblage. Oh, okay. Rassemblage. Okay, interesting. Okay. Which um, I, translates maybe to like assembly, but yeah. it means all those other things I said as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just, I thought I was really taken by that, mm -hmm. so I don't know if you wanted to mm -hmm. expound upon it in some sense or expand. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, sure. It's not my term. There's a woman who I think with a lot, obviously I think a lot with Saidiya Hartman, but the other woman I mentioned a couple of times uh, in the talk is a Haitian anthropologist by training, um, but she's since evolved into um, a performing artist as well. Her name is Gina U Athena Ulysse, and I really, I'm up here making lots of recommendations. I recommend that you check her out online. She writes beautifully about the ways in which we can recover or pay attention to epistemological formations, ways of knowing from the Caribbean and from Haiti in particular, that help us better understand the contemporary world. That we don't, we talked about this in, in our class, right? That we don't always need to reach for Western or European terminology and concepts in order to grasp our modern condition. And one of these key terms that she uses is the one that, that you were taken by, which is rassemblage. Um, rassemblage is what we do um, you know, to start a ceremony, any kind of ritual or ceremony, we gather. We gather bodies, we gather spirits, we gather energies, but we also, also gather, gather material. Um, that material can be objects that are resonant in some way, that mean something to someone, it can be documents, it can be data. It's anything you need to make the thing happen and to make it happen um, in a sort of community or collectivity. It's a beautiful, beautiful term, um, and she uses it a lot. And if you just plug it in online, you'll see countless examples of how it's used in the Haitian community and, and beyond. So I have mm. one more question that I think um, that we didn't arrive at, actually, in the seminar, partially because you provided us with such a, a cool list of things to read and think about. And that's we covered like, a lot of ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, but how did you arrive personally uh, to the subject matter of Haiti? That's such a sweet question. <laughs> it's um, a little bit of a long story. I'm not Haitian. I'm not Haitian American. My ancestry is black American, Hawaiian, and Bahamian. So Haiti was, is a little bit far off my own kind of biographical map. But um, the shortest version of the story I can give you is when I was studying um, in, as an undergraduate, my thesis director was a guy named Henry Louis Gates, Jr who um, was my thesis advisor for African-American studies, but I was also doing French. And at the time, um, you could either write a thesis about one or the other of your two concentrations, or you could try to find something that, that brought them both together. And I wanted to do that. And Gates, it turns out, this is a 
It's a long <laughs> story, but it's kind of a funny story. And anyway, so Gates, I'll be fast. Gates was a fan of Josephine Baker, and he's like, you should go to Paris, and you should go to this archive. I know the archive is, I'm gonna give you a letter. You're gonna immerse yourself in Josephine Baker. You're gonna write your thesis about that. I'm like, cool, cool. Go to Paris, go to this archive, and in the archive, I found out this crazy thing happened where in 1931, there's this huge colonial exhibition in Paris where they like bring all, like they make people come from Africa and like put on clothing and stand like in a zoo while Parisians walk around and like toss coins at them and make them do or what have you. Josephine Baker, who is from St. Louis, Missouri, didn't speak a word of France. Are you from St. Louis, Missouri? All right, there you go, guys. Missouri in the house. Um, she was elected queen of the colonies for this exhibition, which is bananas, because she's not from the colonies, and she's not queen of nothing, and what have you. But the thing was, this group of anti-colonial, revolutionary, avant-garde poets, the Surrealists, wrote a pamphlet going on about how the exhibition was, was colonialist, imperialist, and problematic, and how Josephine Baker, Baker needed to be decrowned or dethroned or what have you. So then I was like, who are these surrealists? They sound saucy. And I looked into them and found out that during the Second World War, when a lot of European intellectuals, like many other people, fled Europe because France was being occupied to the Caribbean and discovered all of these Caribbean writers, that the surrealists had gone to Haiti. One of them in particular, André Breton, we talked about this a little bit in class when we talked about Adriana. He had gone to Haiti, given a series of lectures to a bunch of rowdy college students and articles uh, and artists, and those college students and artists took his words and used them really as the incendiary catalyst to launch a revolution that ended up deposing a Haitian dictator. And so then I was like, Haiti? <laughs> I want to stay here, and that's like that's I didn't I never looked back. I stayed in Haiti for the rest of my academic work, really, and then into the wider Caribbean. Because then, yeah, like I've told you guys, I discovered that Haiti is the center of the world. So why would I keep working on Josephine Baker and or France? <laughs> so yeah. Since you brought up André Breton, mm. yeah, it's on. Since you brought up André Breton, would you talk about? Would you expand actually on that and his uh, relationship with like Hippolyte and? the Centrar and all that yeah. uh, artistic um, genesis that started mm -hmm. at actually in the modern era. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for the question, Danny. Um, so, you know, every, the 1940s in Haiti were just like this crazy, extraordinary time of cultural flourishing and blossoming. Um, many different intellectuals. So there was a guy there, his name was Pierre Mabille. He's an anthropologist, and he was also the attaché culturel, the, the ambassador from um, non-occupied France to Haiti. So he was an attaché culturel in Haiti. And his really wonderful idea was to bring as many voices from throughout the Caribbean, the Americas, and whoever could make it from Europe to come to Haiti and exchange with the people he found so fascinating there. So among the people he invited were like Fifredo Lam, the Cuban painter, André Breton, obviously, Aimé Césaire from Martinique, um, Michel Léris, who was a brilliant Haitian anthro uh, French anthropologist, Alfred Métro, a Swiss anthrop anthropologist, one of the folks who was there at that time was a man named DeWitt Peters, who was an American, who had come to Haiti to teach English and just kind of was, like, got into art. He dropped his job teaching, giving English classes, and started to work with Haitian autodidacts, right, so people who had not been trained to make art, but who he believed were absolutely, things we were talking about, capable of representing themselves in their island in ways that could only be represented by them. And so he, with a little bit of funding and a lot of will, started what's called the Centre d'Art. And Hippolyte is one of the artists that went through the Centre d'Art. You know, it, and it exists to this day. It's in Paul Prince. It's expanded. It, it, it's one of the few really safe places where an entire archive of Haitian art from the 1940s to the present moment is housed. Um, it lost. There was some loss during the earthquake, obviously, but nonetheless, the Centre d'Art is this continuing institution from the 1940s to this day. And so when Breton came in 1945, it wasn't like, you know, some virgin territory. These were people who had been in the world from within the space of their island, who were making art, who were writing literature, who were politically active, and who understood themselves as, yes, in many ways, isolated in the space of their island, or even their third of an island, but were constantly speaking beyond the borders of Haiti through art, through literature, through politics. And as the Second World War was drawing to, drawing to a close, 
the Haitian art scene, intellectual scene, avant-garde scene was like, this is it. We're about to be plugged in to the greater world. Like, this is our chance to make ourselves known in these respects. And Breton, um, well, he never really claimed, and nor did Pierre Mabi, all right, uh, very quickly. He gave this speech. He was signed on to give something like 11 lectures. He wasn't able to give all of them because after this revolution happened where the president was deposed, he and Mabi were summarily kicked out of the country as being troublemakers. So he very, very adamantly never claimed credit for that revolution, only said, I went to give a couple of speeches at the university. I don't know what happened. But there's this kind of sense that he was at the right place and lit the spark for what was on its way to happening in any case. So if you look at like um, histories of surrealism, it's such a footnote. Like you have to scrape through the archive to find this connection on that side, so like so for the surrealist side. But on the, in the context of Haitian history, Haitian art history, we know about the ways in which that moment of cultural foment that involved the avant-garde and the left from Europe really ignited something in Haiti, a pivotal moment in its own history. So yeah. I don't know yeah, that answer. So it's fast. I mean, the 1940s in Haiti from about 41 to 46 is just so worth diving into. Amazing things were created then. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Hey, how you doing? I'm well. How are you? <laughs> Good. Um, thank you for your time. This was an amazing talk. Thank um, you. The book suggestions are great, too. Cool. I hope you all will um, read them. So I'm an artist, and uh, I, you know, kind of go between this fictional narrative for my work mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, a historical reference. Okay. So as I was listening to your story, I was trying to understand when you said that there were historical gaps in the um, and the records that, mm. that made it impossible for you to tell the full story of, mm. the, of culture or of the history of like slavery, which essentially you said Haiti mm. kind of is a good, is kind of the center of a, of a lot of it. Mm. Um, were, were you saying that these writers were using fiction as a way to keep people engaged? Or what, 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 why was, so, so why was fiction kind of the way to go instead of, I guess, more rigorous research or hmm. maybe more argument to the fact, hmm. you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to really, you. Yeah. you know, I'm curious about the inspiration behind, like, you know, using fiction when, you know, coming from someone who is super academic, you know, departure mm -hmm. from like their, their typical methodology. Thank you. I, I, I take your point. So I guess, well, one thing I, I want to make really clear is Kind of the point of what I was saying is fiction doesn't um, mean not rigorous research. On the contrary, what's happening in these fictional works is the rigorous research is done and it is found to be insufficient to tell the stories that these writers, that we as academics know must be there, but because of the way the historical reg record is constituted are deliberately omitted or disregarded. So they're lost, they're, they're left on the cutting room floor. But how then, if those have been left on the cutting room floor and swept away into like the, you know, I'm getting carried away with the metaphor, but swept away into the dustbin of, his, of history, how can we go pick them up again? Well, we can't actually do that because time marches on and they are gone. But what we can do is think through our own humanity. We can think through the stories that we know we can think through the ways that we respond in the present to tragedy and to trauma and look prophetically back at the past and take from it what we need to build the present. And that present is the stories that they tell, right? So if we take a devastating event like Katrina, and we know that thankfully people have gone immediately down there and taken oral histories, right? Tried to recover to the historical record, the horrors that happened to people who were abandoned essentially by the United States government, largely for reasons of race and capital, right? Because of their poverty, because of their blackness, they did not matter to the project of the state, right? So, but unlike in the time of colonial slavery, 
where again, you have an entire class cast of people who did not matter because of their blackness, because of their poverty, because of their marginalization. But nobody was going to take down their stories. But we can extrapolate from what we know about black life in the present and know that the ancestors to that black life would have responded similarly to their traumas and tragedies. And from that, we can pick up these things that got left in the dustbin and tell stories. We can't claim them to be capital H history textbook true, but they're true. They're true, right? These things happen to someone. And we rely then on our writers and our artists and our musicians to give us the words and the feelings that enable us to feel that truth, even when the archive tells us nothing happened here. There's no story to see here, right? So that's what I mean. So the, the research is done. Evelyn Trouillot, Miriam Chancy, Edwige Dantica, they teach history classes, literature classes. They've done the homework. But at a certain point, the archive is just like, nothing to see here. So then what do you do? Do you give up and say, well, I guess black people don't have a story? No, you make the stories. Um, and you ground them sufficiently in the research to make them feel like truth. Does that clarify a little, a little bit what I was trying to? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.